being with us. Uh, just time for a quick recap of the week. And first, first, let us deal here with the elephant in the room. Last week, we made a unicorn-themed appeal to Scotland. <laughs> not to leave the UK. On Thursday, this happened. Voters in Scotland have rejected independence and have chosen to remain a part of the United Kingdom. The kingdom is saved! <laughs> the kingdom is saved! Uh, it, is, it is not often you get to say that outside of a live-action role-play setting. <laughs> the kingdom is secure. I've secured the kingdom. One of the incredible things about this Scottish referendum was not how people voted, but how many people voted. On Thursday, voters turned out in their biggest numbers in Scottish electoral history. Some incredible turnout figures, let me tell you. Sterling, 90%. Um, never seen anything like it. East Renfrewshire, I think, is actually even higher. Is it 90.5%? <laughs> it just can't. It, it can't be. I had no idea the Scots were even physically capable of making a mark on a piece of paper. No idea. 88% <laughs> voted in Clackmannanshire. There's no way Clackmannanshire is not a made-up place. They're lying to us. They're lying to us. <laughs> if you watched the returns on Thursday, there was one amazing detail. For some reason, each council read not just the totals of yes and no votes, but also the reasons why some votes were not counted. The reasons for rejection are as follows. Want of an official mark, zero. Voting in favour of both answers, 13. Four for writing a mark by which the voter could be identified. Also, uh, one vote saying the person reading this is an ass waffle. <laughs> um, one vote reading, Kathy, I love you, please take me back, it's Mark. <laughs> 14 drawings of a unicorn having sex with another unicorn. <laughs> and 11,000 votes for D's nuts. So the... <laughs> The winner is these nuts. Democracy doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> Mo moving on. Moving on. Th there was also voting this week in New Zealand. Now, you may know it as the homeland of Lord, uh, or, or that place where people who are happier than you go on vacation. <laughs> now, on Saturday, they re-elected their Prime Minister, John Key, despite a turbulent campaign with a major scandal that engulfed him earlier this week. Rap superstar Eminem's become the latest to take pot shots at our government. Why is Eminem getting involved? <laughs> is he concerned about the South Island's rising wallaby population? <laughs> if so, good for you, Eminem. Those things are giant rats with pouches. They must be stopped. <laughs> Unless uh, something else was bothering him. It's all over Andrew this campaign ad. And the National Party's economic management. New Zealand is heading in the right direction. But what's wrong right with now. it, say Eminem's publishers, is that the Nats didn't ask if they could use the song. That's right. The ruling party of New Zealand was accused of ripping off Eminem. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I can't imagine how angry that must have made Eminem. <laughs> uh, I'd go so far as to say that New Zealand has made an enemy of Eminem. <laughs> but, <laughs> perhaps... Perhaps the reason it didn't affect the outcome of the election is that the party's campaign manager had this brilliant legal defence. What's your understanding of the legality of your campaign song? Oh, we think it's um, pretty legal. I think these guys are just having a, having a crack um, and, um, and uh, having a bit of an eye for the main chance because it's an election campaign. Pretty legal? That is not a concept that exists. That's like being sort of dead. <laughs> I want to see that man as a defence lawyer. Your Honour, uh, my client pleads probably not. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> seven <to> crack. <laughs> and, and finally this week, it was another terrible seven days for the NFL, with yet more news regarding serious domestic abuse. Everyone had significant questions for NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell regarding how the NFL handles domestic abuse and what specific plans he has to improve things in the future. And so on Friday, he spent an entire 45 minutes answering none of them. These incidents demonstrate that we can use the NFL to help create change. We are taking a number of steps. We will re-examine, enhance, and improve all of our current programs, and then we'll do more. There will be changes to our personal conduct policy. I know this because we will make it happen. We've acknowledged that we need to change what we're doing. Now we have to get to what are those changes going to be? And in so saying, I have effectively made sounds which, when put together, constitute words which can then be turned into sentences that make noise to travel into your ears, and that's 45 minutes. I've done it! Goodell out! <laughs> Clear eyes! Full hearts! Can't take my job! Fuck you! Fuck you!
The, the low point of the press conference might have been when Goodell had this exchange with a reporter from TMZ. I would have loved to have seen that tape. Should we do more to get that information in the future? That's a question but I Mr. want Commissioner, these we, experts to do. We found out by one phone call. You guys have a whole legal department. OK. <laughs> you, you know, you know that things are not going well when you lose the moral high ground to a TMZ reporter. <laughs> a man, a man whose employer ran a story this week titled Nicki Minaj bamboobles her ass critics. <laughs> And the thing is, Goodell wasn't just getting criticised in the room. If you were watching on ESPN, you could see NFL players live tweet the proceedings, including Darius Butler, who wrote, <laughs> this press conference is pointless. <laughs> but truly, but truly, the single greatest reaction to the entire Goodell press conference debacle came from wide receiver Sidney Rice, who wrote simply, boo this man, ghost emoji. <laughs> and I really think that says it all. Bravo, Sydney. Bravo. <laughs> Boo this man, ghost emoji, indeed. And now, this. And now, newscasters using a 50-year-old reference to talk about the future. You know, we sort of gauge everything right in life based on how close we come to the Jetsons. Remember the Jetsons, the family flying in their car? The Jetsons, right? Remember that cartoon? Technology is going to make it so that we only work four days a week. Yep. And the Jetsons. Does anyone other than the Jetsons and some people in Silicon Valley do this? It's, it's like the Jetsons. Jetsons. It's, it's like the Jetsons. It's like uh, from the Jetsons. Don't you think it's like the Jetsons? George Jetson <laughs> and what was the name of the dog? What was the name? Elmo. How could, oh, how, how could I forget? Oh, Astro. Astro. Astro? Astro was the name of the dog. Oh, yeah, it was an Elmo. <laughs> <laughs> that was a different little kid. Yeah. <laughs> moving on, moving on, moving on. Let's talk, let's talk about Cuba. Uh, you don't hear much about it on American television unless Anthony Bourdain takes a trip there to try their <laughs> street food whilst drunkenly speculating about dead men's genitals. My theory always was that Hemingway was hung like a hamster. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Oh, oh, you're right. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. We googled hamster penis and this is what you find. That's adorable. There is nothing wrong with that. But look, <laughs> I digress. Cuba. Earlier this month, the president made a major decision regarding US relations with Cuba, although you probably didn't hear about it unless you were watching Spanish language television. El presidente Obama extendió por un año más el embargo comercial contra Cuba, según informes de la Casa Blanca, renovando así la ley que prohíbe a las empresas estadounidenses hacer negocios con la isla. Yes, America has renewed its trade embargo with Cuba. That's a big deal. And yet that was the only clip we could find reporting it, because apparently Spanish-speaking people are the only ones who give whatever the Spanish for two shits is. <laughs> I, I'm guessing it's dos equis. Now... <laughs> Now, first, first, and I'll, I'll admit this, I'll admit this, I had no idea the Cuban embargo had to be renewed once a year. I just assumed it was like an Amazon Prime trial. You just, <laughs> you sign up once and it simply rolls on without you even noticing. But apparently, one of the components of the embargo is the Trading with the Enemy Act, which requires that the president must annually sign a piece of paper saying that its continuation for one year is in the national interest which is a strangely routine way to go about renewing legislation, which in Cuba is deeply controversial. The embargo is a constant talking point on the island, and most Cubans blame it for the shortages of everything, from concrete to build roads and houses to food shortages. Cubans blame the embargo for everything. The economy, the weather, the complete collapse of Homeland in its second season, which, <laughs> which, to be fair, Cubans probably haven't seen. But if they do, they'll hate it and they'll blame the embargo for it. <laughs> the, the embargo seems like something from a different era, and that is probably because it is. The U.S. embargo was put into place by President Kennedy in 1962. Exactly. The, the Cuban embargo dates back to the Kennedy era, and at the time it probably made some sense. We'd just been through the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was the closest we'd ever been to Armageddon, until the explosive reaction to the Fifty Shades of Grey casting announcement. <laughs> I'm sorry, but Jamie Dornan has all the charisma of a sandwich bag filled with iceberg lettuce. <laughs> he is not my Christian. Hashtag not my Christian. <laughs> but, but look, it's, it's been a while. It's been a while 
since Cuba was a genuine threat. And by continuing the embargo, we're not just pissing them off, we're pissing off almost the entire world. The UN General Assembly is pressing for the 22nd time, by the way, for the US to end its embargo against the country. 188 countries voted for lifting the embargo. Israel was the only country that joined the US in voting against us. Oh, yes, the US and Israel together alone again. <laughs> oh, although, to be fair, in 2012, the group supporting the embargo did have another powerful member, specifically the island nation of Palau. <laughs> what a coalition! America, Israel and Palau. <laughs> the peanut butter and jelly and traditional Palauan fruit bat soup of foreign <laughs> policy. But last year... Last year, even Palau decided it couldn't support the embargo anymore. And you know what they say, when you've lost Palau, you can forget about the Maldives. <laughs> sure, you've got to remember the Maldives first, but then you have to forget about them. <laughs> but, but, look, don't listen to the rest of the world. Who gives a shit what they think? The truth is, even our own standards for this embargo seem a little bit shaky. Remember the Trading with the Enemy Act from earlier? Well, Cuba is currently the only country on it. There used to be another one, until this happened. I'm issuing a proclamation that lifts the provisions of the Trading with the Enemy Act with respect to North Korea. <laughs> Not even North Korea is on that list anymore. <laughs> and look, a list of enemies without them is like a list of cycloptic clawed penises without the 2012 Olympic mascots. It's meaningless. <laughs> Your list is incomplete. Which, which is not to say that the Cuban government is a good regime. Look, in, in Freedom House's most recent report, Cuba got a repression score of 6.5 out of 7, which does sound embargo-worthy, were it not for the fact that many of our biggest trading partners have similar scores. China also got a 6.5, and Saudi Arabia got a full 7. <laughs> and do you know how hard it is to get a perfect score? <laughs> They'll dock you a full point just for hooking up jumper cables to the wrong testicle. But, <laughs> but we're happy to overlook those scores we do it all the time. Because if we only traded with countries with perfect human rights records, our only imports would be maple syrup and Smurfs. <laughs> and perhaps the craziest part of all of this is that if you really want the perfect argument for ending the Cuban embargo, you don't need to listen to any other country on the planet. You just need to listen to this guy. I think it's time for us to end the embargo on Cuba. The Cuban embargo has failed to provide uh, the sorts of rising standards of living and has squeezed uh, uh, the innocence in Cuba. So uh, it, it's time for us to acknowledge that that particular policy has failed. Sure, we could acknowledge that, or we could just keep doing it until it somehow magically unfails. 52nd year's the charm, baby! Woo! <laughs> and now, this. And now. People on the news laughing at one another with varying degrees of sincerity. Teachable moment, Chris. Right. We all need those sometimes. I have them, like, what, every 17 seconds? About that, yeah. <laughs> 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 Very good. Variety, Will Ferrell. I hope it's true. <laughs> Amy certainly is. Okay. <laughs> and finally, finally tonight, last Sunday, last Sunday, one of the weirdest annual events on television took place yet again. Get ready for the lip gloss, the spray tans, the blood, sweat, and sequins. I'm pumped up. Ladies and gentlemen, your 2015 Miss America semi-finalist. Beautiful. Beautiful. And just a reminder to those of you at home, it is the year 2014, and I am a fully clothed man standing in front of a line of women in swimsuits awaiting judgment. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> yes. Last Sunday was the Miss America pageant, and through it all, the swimsuits, the dance numbers, the inexplicable ventriloquism, it was, <laughs> it was very difficult not to think, how the fuck is this still happening? <laughs> Beauty pageants haven't really made sense since an era when people talked like this. Girls, 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 everyone lovely and talented. One from nearly every state in the Union, including Alaska. Oh, including Alaska, yes! 
And you know why they mention that? Because Alaska had only just become a state back then. <laughs> in fact, in the early days, it made sense to have a contest with criteria like this. The very first years, there was a literal breakdown. Five points for the construction of the head. Five points for the limbs. Three points for the torso. Two points for the leg. Three points for the torso. I think even back then, that was code. Hey, I met this great dame, see? She's got a great torso, see? <laughs> 34 the torso, you should meet her. How's the construction of her head? It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. The... But the only time that beauty pageants are relevant nowadays is whenever someone forwards you a link to something like this. I believe that our ed education, like such as in South Africa and uh, the Iraq, everywhere like such as, and I believe that they should, uh, our education over here in the U.S. should help the U.S. Uh, or should help South Africa and should help the Iraq and the Asian countries. Now, 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 to be fair, the question she was asked was, can you do an impression of a dictionary in a washing machine? And, and I think everyone, she nailed that. She nailed that. Look, 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 no. It is easy to make fun of pageant contestants, but which is really crazier? That they sometimes give stupid answers or that they are almost always asked ridiculously complex questions? Government tracking of phone records has been in the news lately. Is this an invasion of privacy or necessary to keep our country safe? Why or why not? Should people who leak classified documents in the name of public information be charged with treason? In recent weeks, the U.S. has released five detainees from Guantanamo in exchange for one U.S. soldier held captive in Afghanistan. The U.S. policy is to leave no soldier behind. Do you think it's fair to sacrifice or swap lives in order to uphold this policy? <laughs> what? totally agree with the guy in the background there. <laughs> because I sincerely doubt the intricacies of hostage exchanges are going to be resolved by a 21-year-old PR major and the star of Sharknado. <laughs> in fact, last Sunday, this was an actual question. The savagery of the ISIS threat to our security was demonstrated by the gruesome videos of two journalists and an aid worker being beheaded. What should our country's response be? That's right. They asked one of the contestants to solve ISIS. <laughs> and she only had 20 seconds to do it. <laughs> How did she do? This is an absolute outrage and something definitely needs to be done, but I don't think America needs to be the only one to do it. I really think it's important for the world, for the UN to come together and decide what's the best thing united that we can do to really come together as a bigger and more impactful source to end this horrid, horrid thing that's happening. Holy shit! <laughs> that is a much better answer than I could have done in that amount of time. That is a borderline better answer than the president gave last week. <laughs> In fact, many of last Sunday's contestants were genuinely impressive, and the Miss America pageant would argue that's because they're a classier organisation than their competitors, which is frankly not difficult. Miss USA, for instance, is owned by Donald Trump, a, <laughs> a clown made of mummified foreskin and cotton candy. <laughs> but... And look, he's... He's pretty blunt about his criteria. Well, obviously, it's great outer beauty. I mean, we could say politically correct that the look doesn't matter, but the look obviously matters. Like, you wouldn't have your job if you weren't beautiful. It is a little ironic that the Miss USA beauty pageant is overseen by one of the ugliest souls on the planet. <laughs> but, but look, Miss America is supposed to be different from all that. Miss America is about something more than just looks. This is a scholarship pageant, Lee. Miss America funds scholars. It's the largest scholarship program in the world for women. It's easy to think that this is just a beauty pageant, but this is a scholarship pageant Miss America is. Right. Yeah, right, you need to see them in bathing suits, because, as we all know, the intelligence portion of the brain is located somewhere on the upper thigh. <laughs> In fact, Miss America trades on their scholarship claims so much. If you call the Miss America headquarters, this is what you hear. Thank you for calling the Miss America organization, the world's largest provider of scholarships for women. OK, that is suspiciously defensive right out of the gate. 
That is like Walter White saying, hello and welcome to this regular car wash that's definitely not laundering money for my meth lab. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> welcome. If, if it is actually true that Miss America is the world's largest provider of scholarships for women, that's a little bit weird. Because Miss America does not offer scholarships to all women, only those who compete in its pageants. So, to qualify for a scholarship, you'll need to certify not just that you've never been married, but also that you are not now pregnant and never have been. Which, of course, makes sense. Miss America is supposed to be a role model for children. How can she be that if she's got a child in tow who's constantly looking up to her? <laughs> and and those, those are just the official rules you need to abide by. If you want a shot at winning one of their scholarships, you're also going to need access to a can of this stuff. Butt glue, a spray adhesive essential for keeping those bikini bottoms on their bottoms. Just, just think about that for a second. Oh, how did the scholarship interview go? Well, my ass is still sticky. I think I got it. I think I got it. And Miss America, Miss America doesn't just say it's the biggest scholarship organization. It backs this up with numbers. We are the nation's largest scholarship program for young women with $45 million made available annually. $45 million? That is an unbelievable amount of money. As in, I literally didn't believe that. <laughs> it's the kind of number that can get stuck in your head and rattle around there for days, driving you crazy. Making you wish, for instance, there was a way to find out more. Find out more at MissAmericaFoundation.org. And that is where all this craziness began. We went to their website, and to be honest, it wasn't a great sign that their About Us page says, We Fund Scholars. <laughs> uh, you, uh... You really might want to, uh... You really might want to butt glue a D onto the end of that word. <laughs> but it was then, while digging around on their site, that we discovered that Miss America and its foundation are registered non-profits, which means they have to file public tax forms. So what we were looking for was that crazy number, $45 million. What we found instead was that in 2012, at the national level, they spent less than $500,000 in cash scholarships, <laughs> leaving us a mere $44.5 million short of what they say they provide. And at this point, we really had a clear choice. We could have just thought, sure, the numbers don't really add up, but it's only Miss America who really gives a shit. <laughs> or, or we could try to pull the tax forms from every state-level competition in the country, because this was starting to drive us fucking insane. <laughs> it's been a weird week here. We got 33 states 990 forms and attempted to contact everyone else, but even making the most generous assumptions for every state and local pageant that we didn't get, we couldn't get even close to $4 million. <laughs> when, remember, they are claiming this. $45 million made available annually. How the fuck is that possible? <laughs> how's, how's that possible? At this point, we were in way too deep, so we just called Miss America, which is when we first heard this. Thank you for calling the Miss America organization, the world's largest provider of scholarships for women. And it turns out the key word there is provider. Some schools offer scholarships directly to pageant contestants, and the trick is Miss America counts all of them, not just the ones they can physically take. So, for instance, Miss Pennsylvania's website says it offers the winner scholarships to these four colleges, and the value of every single scholarship is counted together, despite the fact that she is clearly going to attend at most one, because <laughs> she's not going to attend four colleges. She's not James fucking Franco. <laughs> furthermore... <laughs> furthermore... Miss Alabama, in its 2012 filing, said it provided nearly $2.6 million in scholarships to just one school, Troy University, which blew my mind. <laughs> because if that's true, that must be the single prettiest school anywhere in America. <laughs> but when we contacted Troy, it turns out the pageant got to that $2.6 million by multiplying the value of a single scholarship by 48, the number of competitors who could theoretically accept it. <laughs> Even though the actual number of contestants who accepted a scholarship that year was, and you are not going to believe this, zero. <laughs> Absolute zero. 
Meaning that the difference between the money they provided and the money they awarded was all of the money they provided. <laughs> and, and at this point, we just had to stop because it was 35 minutes ago and we had to take this show. <laughs> but it does seem that two things are true. One, Miss America gives out way less than $45 million in scholarships. And yet, two, whatever the number is, one thing does still seem to be troublingly true. The Miss America organization is actually the largest provider of scholarships to women in the world. Yeah, because even their lowest number is more than any other women-only scholarship that we could find. More than the Society of Women Engineers, whose website is here. Uh, more than the Patsy Mink Foundation, here. Uh, and more than the Jeanette Rankin Women's Scholarship Fund, here. All of which you can donate to if you want to change the fact that currently the biggest scholarship program exclusively for women in America requires you to be unmarried with a mint-conditioned uterus <laughs> and also rewards working knowledge of buttock adhesive technology. <laughs> which is just a little bit unsettling. And, in fact, let me try to explain why to the Miss America organisation through the only medium it seems to value. 20-second conversations with women in evening dresses and sashes. <laughs> Please join me. <laughs> Welcome to Miss Last Week Tonight. I'm proud to say, as of now, we are the world's largest provider of scholarships for women, because tonight, 400 million $1 scholarships will be made available <laughs> to the winner, of which she may choose just one. <laughs> so let's bring out our first contestant, Miss First Contestant! <laughs> Radiant. Um, question number one. Um, what does the continued existence of the Miss America pageant say about how women are viewed in America? You have 20 seconds. Go. Beginning with the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848 that spurred first wave feminism, the perception of women in America has always been complex and fluid. <laughs> While it is theoretically possible that Miss America could evolve into a purely academic scholarship organization, at this point in time, the notion that beauty pageants are about anything other than outer beauty is belied both by the continued existence of the swimsuit portion and the fact that I'm expected to answer this question in just 20 seconds. Thank you very much. That's, that's very, tremendous. Tre tremendous. Beautiful. Uh, and now, please welcome our final contender, Miss Kathy Griffin. <laughs> Miss Kathy, your question. Mm -hmm. When providing access to scholarships, is there any place whatsoever for the judgment of a woman's body? Oh, I have no problem with that at all. Wait, what, really? Nope, no problem whatsoever. As long as men are subjected to the same demeaning process. Let me show you what I mean. Giuseppe, get out here. No, 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 oh, shit. Uh, okay, all right. What exactly are you doing here, Captain? All right, I am judging you as a host next to him. Uh, well. All okay. right, John, walk that runway, give us a twirl. Oh, shit, it's just... <laughs> Those things about a lot more than looks, Kathy. It's about just. Now, don't do that with your hands. It's, it's not just about. It's not just about looks, Kathy. Well, look, that's only 20% of your total score. Now, I'm giving this one to Giuseppe because, frankly, he wins on muscle mass, legs, and of course, construction of the head. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I, I, I get your point. No, let me explain why I'm giving you a lower score. I look at Giuseppe and I want to have sex with him. Mm -hmm. I look at you and I want to have sex with Giuseppe. Oh, come on, Kathy. I'm a good person, Kathy. You know what? I am calling it Giuseppe wins. No! No, not Giuseppe wins. No, get off me, Giuseppe. I'm not happy for you. I'm not happy for you. I feel terrible about myself. Pageants are horrible. They're horrible. Do you know what? That's our show. My thanks to Kathy Griffin. My thanks to Kathy Griffin. Fuck you, Giuseppe. Please, please join us again next week. We'll see you next week. Good night. <laughs>